title of my uh, talk to performance to go go as I'm attempting something new for me so it's more of a free form loose and groovy talk uh, moving mostly <laughs> chronologically through the past two years of my travel and work experience starting back at my sabbatical so move back in time to academic year 2012 uh, 2013 and to afford a year-long sabbatical, I packed up everything I owned. I put it on a pod for the 14 plus or minus months, so I didn't have any monthly housing bills. I knew I was going to New York City for August and Italy for September, but at that moment in July, as the truck pulled away with everything I owned, uh, I had no energy, no home, no goal. I was pretty bottomed out and empty. So what was the first thing that I did? I watched all nine seasons of The X-Files, <laughs> plus both feature films in sequence. <laughs> Don't ask the Angel of Prods actually how many hours that is, because Hudson did the math and it's really embarrassing. <laughs> At the same time, I stayed at a pal's house here in Alfred um, that, was, that was vacant for the summer. And I lived very lightly. I spent little money. I only ate salad. I saw no one but Mulder and Scully. And within this deep retreat, I began to focus on the one thing I could make room for. Hand crimping over 300 tiny rivets holding on long ribbon ties to a white dress. One by one, as I hand tightened each tooth on each sparkly rivet, I was preparing myself for the year by preparing for my first residency, leading to the first performance work in Terni, Italy. I was due to live and work there for over a month as an artist in residence to present at their festival of contemporary art. And after that experience, I presented the work Charme. So in the US before Mulder and Scully took over, I had started some research on tyranny, uh, and the only information I could get about the city from here was it was the origin place of St. Valentine, the real person. Um, so I made these renderings. These are, you know, me thinking towards the performance, um, cited, but then gathering the images about the, the, the kind of performative visuals. Um, and I festooned myself with these little red gift boxes, weighing myself down with the cliches of love. It was a possible starting point, and I knew enough to keep the boxes conceptually empty until I could arrive and do more research. And when I did arrive, I discovered that tyranny is just a regular working class city. They are really tr trying desperately to hold on to their own identity and not get sucked into the urban sprawl uh, that's increasing because it's only an hour outside of Rome and the commuter population is growing and th in the city they're quite nervous about holding on to their own identity. Tyranny is a romantic city, absolutely, and it's easy to get caught up in that as a visitor, but of course it's also a real functioning urban center. So I began my research by walking the city to get to know it. And as I did, I asked the people who were open to chatting with me for an extended time in shops and cafes and pathways what was the most romanticized aspect of the city? Where was it easy to get caught up in that from an insider's perspective? And no one that I talked to at the time had any connection to St. Valentine or that history at all, but almost all that I spoke to replied that the waterfall in the city was still the most romanticized and romantic feature of the city. It's um, actually the tallest waterfall in all of Europe, and it was once a stop on the Victorian era Grand Tour. And it's still a source of pride for the city. It's both beautiful and vital as it powers the industrial steel mill that still functions there, which is the city's main source of income. So I began to realize that the boxes needed to be filled with a token of the city itself. 
and a dual-sided, a two-sided token with a historic etching of the waterfall on one side and it was on thick mirrored glass so that the mirror on the opposing side offered a true reflection. It was a souvenir to give back to the residents. So it took me some time to do the research about the city and find the, these um, responses to my, my being there. So once I knew what I wanted to create for the boxes, I needed help actually with the production. So this is one of the workshop afternoons with volunteers, including Kiata, who's in the foreground, who served almost as the project's producer, which I had never really had before in my career. And she assisted me with the research and the translations and the rides to the waterfall and her own Italian feminist artist overview of as we were working through this piece. She really became my sounding board, almost a collaborator. And Badali, who's in the center, became my studio assistant who helped not only with the workshop preparation but also in stuffing each of the boxes. They, the, the souvenir couldn't be loose in the box because it kind of tumbled around so we had to stuff it with appropriate um, almost metallic-y paper to hold everything tight and, and um, nice for the, for the performance. And so here's a little bit of an aside. I had two great studios over the five weeks that I was in residence in the Art Center and the whole Art Center uh, housed two museums one of, for art and one for historic artifacts, a really big impressive theater, uh, the cultural offices for the city and a cafe. And then here was my other studio and the name of the whole art center is Chaos, which is chaos, the translation. So the image on the right is the night before the performance. That's the completed dress with the uh, boxes all stuffed and tied on to the 300 rivets. Uh, it took five helpers to actually hold its weight and open it enough so I could shimmy into the dress from underneath and then I realized, hey, glass is heavy. <laughs> Which maybe I should have realized that before the night, before the performance. But then uh, here's me beginning the performance of Charmé. And the title, Charmé, comes from uh, a popular photo romanzo, which is uh, a kind of soap opera in printed form, which is popular in Italy. So I'm referencing directly the heightened cliché, right, the melodrama of love. And Charme relates to the literal charm or token. The woman is wearing a visual metaphor of the weight of romantic trappings, but also literally offering this gifted souvenir. And the woman walked the streets, the path that was devised for over four hours. If someone seemed interested, which was communicated by eye contact or proximity, they had to listen to a single sentence, an old Italian proverb, which I learned in Italian, which now don't ask me because it's a, it's, it's a little gone. But the proverb was, why sever what you can melt? And if they heard that sentence, they were offered a box. But the woman moved on, not waiting for their discovery. And over the duration of the walk, the weight lifted as the boxes were distributed. An evening set in. Some participants were at first quite suspicious about a free gift. Many people thought I was a, a quote unquote gypsy traveler and would not accept uh, a box, but the performance lasted until all the boxes were offered and accepted, until the dress turned into a cascade, making the woman into a, a reflection of the waterfall itself. Now, this is a little bit of kind of hindsight, but in the short time before my sabbatical, my collaborator, who is Teresa Longva, who was an, an AU BFA alum, she graduated in 2008, uh, we developed a durational performance trilogy. So I'm just going to run you through that because it becomes important to the sabbatical. So the first piece was Hunger, a five-hour performance inspired by a family dynamic, but exploring the many relationships between two parent and child, lovers, siblings, teacher, student, clerk and client. Hunger investigates the tenderness and vulnerability in all the ways we can't communicate, 
but long to connect. Then we did Thirst. Now this was our first version of Thirst. It was only two hours and it was more of a kind of works in progress test and a chance for us to get documentation so we could start to apply for the whole trilogy. Um, I'm going to talk more about Thirst coming up um, but I just wanted you to know it started here at Foster Lake with water and hand blown vessels that were created in the hot shop. And then Shelter. This is the third and final performance in this series called the Needs Trilogy. Shelter is also durational but more dynamic with Longva and Carpenter each performing a different but related act. One woman sits at a solid table piled high with small stones. She considers, perhaps counts, and drops each one to the ground. The second woman with a similar, with a similar heavy table and chair strapped to her back attempts to drag an overflowing bag of stones, 400 pounds worth, without dropping any across the length of the space. Both women wear mirrors around the neck that demand that they finally face themselves as they perform these seemingly senseless, endless, yet poignant tasks. There has been a shift from the twinning of hunger and thirst, yet the search continues for each woman, each in her own way. And then just this past June, just over this past summer in 2014, Longo and Carpenter became one of the very first artists featured on Immaterial, which is the online journal for the Marina Abramovich Institute. And the journal's definitely worth looking up um, because it features, you know, it's really the mission of the new institute that's being built in Hudson, New York. Um, and it's, it, it supports long durational everything, natural phenomena, science experiments, collaborations within the arts, as well as durational performance works by other artists. Okay, now, doodly 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 come back to the end of my sabbatical. Uh, a performing arts festival located in Bergen, Norway, which normally features music, theater, dance, and less of a visual art performance, such as I make, so a performing arts festival, had the theme of water. So we were invited to show Thirst for real as part of this prestigious Scandinavian festival. Thirst is inspired and made by water. Two women in matching dress ca carry a clear glass vessel to the water's edge and fill it. In this case, the city's well-known fountain in the main city square, almost like the Times Square of Bergen. The women strain under the weight of the heavy jug, but undeterred head towards their goal, a small drinking glass on a pedestal. The vessels are riddled with holes, however, and steadily leak down the front of the women's dresses, marking their futile effort, and leaving behind only a disappearing trail. So Thirst is duly inspired by two points of reference related to water. One's an ancient myth, and the other is a current and pressing global concern. Some of the most prominent sufferers in ancient mythology are the Danaides, who must forever carry water in leaky jars. And this is their punishment for, for killing the men they were forced to marry. Thirst also investigates the current global water crisis. With the growing scarcity of unusable water and increasing extent of water pollution and overdrafting, are any of our per personal or political actions enough? Thirst speaks to enduring effort, so it's best performed for a standard work day, eight hours with no interruptions. No matter how long the women work, the glass cannot be filled. So I spent three months in Bergen, readying for this performance, but also working as an artist in residence on new projects and ideas. And I had the opportunity to experience gorgeous Bergen, supported by a sizable grant from the Leighton Foundation, which specifically funds self-motivated international artist exchanges. More gorgeous Bergen. I prom promise some tourist images. Here you go. And all these images are from the daily route uh, I took from the apartment I was living in to meet Teresa to start our work together. And I also had beautiful studios here too with that were offered to me as, as residencies by two different arts organizations once I arrived. So this is a beautiful open space 
in the uh, Electronic Arts Center. But look at the view. That was the view right outside those windows. And then this, uh, like, week in the knees studio, uh, I also was able to use for a month. This is a, a well-known artist residency the, at the Sardine, the former Sardine factory, a USF, United Sardine Factory. And one of the artists didn't show up for her month, so I had known the director just from the small scene in the small city, and she said, come and use the studio. And I was kind of close pals with the woman who was working next door, so she helped grease those wheels. And that's where I designed and sewed the thirst dresses. And you guys now can all engage in a debate which uh, view from this studio is more stunning, the day or the evening. And while I was in Norway, I met other artists and we made some stuff. And I had some typical uh, Norway experiences. So here's a fjord. And then I was in the city for the Norwegian National Day. So it was a huge parade through the city streets. So here's one of my images of the parade. You know, ooh, Norway, flags, and you know, traditional costume. But then this is what blew my mind the most. These are the viewers. So everyone, everyone wears the national dress on National Day. And I came to find out the national dress, um, it, they're, they're really specific to the region that you're from. And it's, it's fancy dress that you know, people wear to weddings and to funerals and other formal events in their culture. But this, you know, when, these people weren't in the parade. It was just part of the whole. Uh, Norwegian festival. So the three months in Norway was the zenith of my sabbatical experience and after which I returned to the US and came back to Alfred and saw my, the pod again for the first time and I found a place to live and and came back. Renewed I was able to keep up with my new working ideas and my new network and I remained in the rosy glow for the whole year. Now turn your clock forward to this very past summer, just within the past few months. Teresa came back over to the US so that we could work together again a year later and focus on many of our recent projects that, that took place this past summer. So discrete, discrete, discrete is the English and Norwegian of the word meaning separate and distinct with an inkling of the definition of careful and inconspicuous within the homonym. Discrete, discrete is three linked performances exploring obligation and oppression, both external and internalized, and all the ways we succumb to and reinforce a cultural system that prevents to co true cooperation. In part one, the women are bound by a long band, and you'll recognize that same long band from Hunger. So in Hunger, we sat, we were bound to that handmade knitted form, that Teresa knitted that, um, and we, you know, we, it was a, a metaphor of us being tied together at that table. In this case, however, we took it to the next step and we actually used it as kind of an elastic band. So it was actually, holding our weight, we were able to lean sharply, almost flying. But one sudden move from the other uh, threw off the balance tremendously, causing an ungraceful slip out of that lean. The women, as they were wearing this band and leaning, were each desperately trying to inhale a dangling feather through a narrow drinking straw. Their breathing was constricted, they struggled for the feather, fully depended upon, but also impeded by the other. And we used this performance in New York, again, as, an, a, as a way to engage in a works in progress kind of test. Uh, after not being together for a year, we had some rough patches in our communication. We had to kind of find each other and how we related to each other again and it was across our different languages and across this time apart. And we would work consistently um, over Skype through the year, 
but that is so different. It's so finite. It's so clear. It's so focused. So there's something about coming back together in our, in our everyday lives that we have to find that equilibrium again. So it was very good we had this opportunity to test out some ideas. Um, so in the second part, we tested the idea of each of us doing a very different action to see how that felt. So Teresa is blowing up that super gigantic balloon. And then I'm wearing this dress of all arms, which I had been making over the past school year between coming back from sabbatical and this June when we were in New York. And the dress of all arms just did not work for the Long Van Carpenter piece. So this experience got me thinking about what builds a vernacular of performance. What is the image vocabulary, especially within a collaboration? So somehow this image is mine in terms of visual language. It's not the Long Van Carpenter language. So, which I think is curious because even though so many of the Long Van Carpenter images come from my head, I tend to be not entirely, but, uh, but you know, more than half the kind of image conceiver for Long Van Carpenter. So, uh, you know, I'm usually the one that first sees and sketches and shares kind of initial inklings of an image, uh, including the feather through the straws. So what makes that so clearly to me a Long Van Carpenter image and this dress of all arms not that? Was I somehow able to step in imagining being one of two? Was I thinking as a pair, as a partner, with Teresa's interests and inclinations in mind? What, somehow was I able to, to merge our thinking? What builds a language of imagery? But we did find more in our shared language. Here, the women slump into faceless pillows, facing the glass windows, never able to see the other. They explore the artificiality of forced emotion as laughter mimics crying. Inside, they were only able to see the, the slump and hear the sound, but outside, there's no sound, and they can just see those kind of wild expressions. So the points of access are never fully inclusive. So we were really grateful to be able to have that testing ground and we took these short explorations to the Mostly Performance Festival in, uh, it's actually a festival of ephemeral art in Sokolowsko, Poland. And we were here for a week before the festival. We collaboratively taught a performance workshop in collaborative sculptural site-based performance to nine or ten uh, kind of post-back art students kind of had just completed their degrees. It was a very quiet town. That's the one cafe. That's about how much it was open. Um, and it's, so the town was small and struggling economically, yet it's still significant for its history for being the very first site of the first sanatorium for TB treatment in all of Europe uh, because of the particular air quality that was discovered by German doctor Bremer in 1860. And the massive castle-like sanatorium, which you see can stretches all the way down to that other cupola with the slate, it's huge, like castle, uh, is now being reconstructed into an art center by the in situ foundation that also hosts this festival. So we had some awareness of the history of the town as we developed the works in progress. We kind of were able to pick up on the sanatorium history, but it felt more present, of course, there with the architecture and the air quality itself. So we extended the parts of the performance to augment the concept of breath with bigger, more readable straws and contending with the wind outside. Kino means cinema. We performed kind of on the balcony entrance to the former cinema that was one of the art center, one of the festival sites. We did longer durations of the sections, using up more breath, straining more. And in part three, we changed it to have the women finally facing each other, but their vision is soon obstructed as each breath fills the oversized balloon. The inflatables fill the space between them, then struggle for enough space, rubbing and bumping, nearly bursting, as the twin forms echo the fatigued lungs. With this work, Longva and Carpenter share a resignation. 
If only we could all notice the other as more than a brace for our own distress. In ways both global and personal, our culture glorifies isolated individuation. In response, as artists, we strive to honor our messy, mismatched, embodied humanity. And while uh, we were at the festival, I had the, the huge privilege of meeting two really um, idols of mine, very well-known performers, definitely worth a Google, students, uh, both in their 70s, Alistair McLennan, who performs long, durational, zen-like installed performances, and Boris Nisloni, both of whom are uh, founders of the Black Market Performance Group. So the morning after the festival ended, at 4 a.m., we took a train to another train, to a plane, to a taxi, to a stopover, and I continued alone via bus to a plane to a car to get to Salem, Germany, for a three-plus week artist residency affiliated with Salem Artworks, which is here in New York State, not too far from here. So about 25 other artists, half German and half from the U.S., and this was our residence, a former palace turned into a fancy boarding school with some of us on, sitting on the steps. We had a shared studio space, kind of like the art room, uh, but it was mostly used by artists working in painting and traditional sculpture who needed wall space and ventilation and really specific um, equipment needs. So I mostly worked in my room, but why not with that knockout view? Again, the views, uh, right? It's, there's a big world out there, and that's Lake Constance. So on one side, there's a view of the lake, and the other side, there's the rolling sound of music hills as we were quite close to Switzerland. And I could see the Alps kind of on the other side of Lake Constance. And this residency was more of a communal experience as we lived and worked and ate every meal together. And this is Schloss Salem, which the palace in Salem itself, the site of the exhibitions and what became the site of my research. It was first constructed as an abbey in 1134, and then in the 1800s it became a palace for the region's nobility. And now it's still a residence, a small part is a residence for government officials, it's a historic site, uh, and it houses the region's cultural affairs offices who were our hosts for the residency period. And this is the Baroque Emperor's Room, where the monks would meet dignitaries. And while touring the palace, I started with my visual research, right? I was noticing a lot, <laughs> I mean, and they're noticeable, of hands, uh, lots of layers of gilding. And this gorgeous waterway in front of the palace. And very special stones, veiny stones, here and everywhere that I looked. So the very first day we arrived, so I got in late in the night, the next day they said, okay, we're doing a quick tour of the palace, and then we were taken to the only art supply store, which was over two hours in the hot van. So two hours there and two hours back. So we needed to get everything, anything and everything, we intended to use for the three weeks. So, you know, some artists can't start working until they have materials, like the painters needed canvas and paint, like they couldn't do anything until they got to the art supply store. But for me, who's concept first and the materials kind of come from as I do the research and think through what I'm working on, it was really tough to kind of let go of expectation and just be in my intuition and, you know, follow my excitement. So I bought every pair of white cotton archivist gloves that were there and gold leaf. Um, and I just kind of trusted. And then I was kind of coming out of that experience and all I wanted to do was gold leaf stones. I just, I was obsessed with it. I wanted to gold leaf some stones. I had never gold leaf before and luckily when we were in the art supply store, someone who had worked with gold leaf quite a bit said, you know, you need glue. <laughs> and I, th I don't know what I thought, like you could burnish it on, it was magic. I thought it was alchemy, I thought it was magic. So she was able to get me the glue, so oh, residencies work, right? So I learned something. Uh, all this time I was doing research on the history of the site, more scholarly research. Um, I was interested in the devotional practices of the Cistercian monks, the, the Cistercian order of monks that lived there, which definitely compelled me. And the monks, 
the structure of their day and life was that they slept for eight hours each day, they worked for eight hours each day, and they prayed standing up for eight hours each day, right? I mean, that moves me. Um, and it moves me in a direction as much as the monk's well-documented and specific sexism repels me in a different direction. So I was torn by this complicated history. It's well-documented in some of the kind of, you know, monk's records that um, they should not be disturbed by the chattering women, a and on and on. Um, and also kind of at the same time, I had arrived with an interest in the name of the place, Salem. I grew up near Salem, Massachusetts, and have a long-standing personal interest in that history of the witch trials, as well as contemporary pagan practices. So I wanted to research the local witch persecution, which I knew was prominent in the German history. But it was quite hard to uncover, right? It's, it's definitely um, kept kind of it's you know, not talked about. I don't speak German, wasn't able to read German. Uh, I had some of the German artists who were writers, there was literary people there, um, do some translations for me and then finally when I hit the right spot, I opened a vault of information. So from that I made a quick rendering of a performance in development that I was hoping to offer for the last, the, near the end of the residency which was the opening of the exhibition and the woman is down there in the moat-like waterway. Now, this is just a PS. Uh, the current is deceptively strong in that diverted river, so someone secretly, I was doing some setup and testing the space, and that is a big blue bucket, like it's you know, above my knees, and it was filled with these like, like 10 huge, heavy, bouldery stones. And I was using it to kind of rest things on, I was figuring things out, and the current whipped it, I had to run after it to, to grab that bucket back. So just keep that in mind as the performance comes. And then from all this experience, I created the performance A Maiden Still Less. It was a three and a half hour performance. Here I conflate the devotional practices of the monks and their fascinations with materiality, time, and presence. Fascinations I also share while applying a feminist perspective to reveal the darker history of the witch persecutions of the early modern period. That extend to any wive or braze, therefore brave, therefore outcast woman. This performance was separate from the rest of the exhibitions and performances all inside of the palace. She performed the whole time through the speeches and through people's uh, distraction away from the work. She was alone in her underworldly moat. And the title itself, A Maiden Still Less, is adopted from a record of those locally convicted and burned for witchcraft, unnamed. So the list goes something like this. The apothecary's wife and daughter. The prettiest girl in town, age 19. Four strange wo women found sleeping in the marketplace. A little maiden, nine years of age a maiden still less. The title also refers to the age and experience of the woman here, strengthened now, able to release the burden, no longer an innocent maiden. So you can see the gloves made it into the piece. There are 40 gloves stitched to the dress and each filled with a stone, again creating a weighted garment. And 13 of the stones were gilded with the gold leaf and I was thinking about time the 12, so there's 12 gold stones around my waist and the time, not only the eight hours and eight hours and eight hours, but the monks were obsessed with time and there's even a clock in the nave, in the church, there's a big clock because they believe time is fleeting and in a really symbolic way. And then 13 because that's an important number to um, Wicca, so I had a one gold uh, stone at my heart. Uh, the visual research from the site, I'm wearing the visual research from the site and almost embodying the site. And also I think it's interesting that uh, this relates to the dress of all arms. So I've kind of reclaimed that back into my own working language. I moved supremely slowly, walking probably the 25 yards from the far bridge to this site near where the stairs and the stones were with micro movements of releasing, you know, I would reach in, get a stone and kind of 
so excruciatingly slowly drop the stone into the river. So remember the current. It looks, so it's, right, it's, so, it's so beautiful, but the current was so strong. So as I was getting into play, I was wearing little rubber croc shoes because the stones were quite sharp and there was some broken bits and some metal parts and bottles. So I was wearing these little almost invisible uh, rubber shoes. But as I was getting into place, I stuck my foot into this silty part and it, you know, it sucked up my shoe and I lifted my foot and my foot was bare and then whoosh, there went my shoe unable to be rescued. So then I had this freak out. I was like, should I take off my other shoe? You know, the piece really wasn't about like the walking on coals, the hardship of the walk. I didn't know what, and I should I wear one shoe? Was it visible? How, you know, how crazy is that? So I had this like, you know, even after all this experience, I had this moment uh, and before the performance where I had to figure out like what to do. Ultimately, I decided to wear the shoe because if I needed to step someplace or shift my weight, I would have at least some protection. Um, and it was somewhat noticeable. So people, like, you know, it becomes part of the performance, right? So people and press people all thought that was part of what was so, you know, they couldn't figure out the gloves on the dress or the one shoe, which is so interesting because <laughs> I was so, you know, my intention was so strong with one and like this crazy uh, last minute accident with the other. And then there's the gradual movement of holding and dropping the stones which was mixed with the physicality, the kind of humanness, right? There was this like very beautiful, slow moving, I mean, some would say the excruciation, but I think that, that the, somehow the virtuosity of the move, that slow movement, the mixed with the humanness, right? The kind of messiness of reaching to get every stone out of every glove. And for my focus was the guilt raised on the cathedral, the monk's world. And after three and a half hours, I disappeared into the long hidden tunnel to be able to exit the, the performance. I went into the witch's world. So here's the group of 25 artists and the staff of the German cultural office. And we all became very close after working side by side. But just two days after the performance exhibition opening and long goodbyes, I had another 5 a.m. departure and I had to quickly shift gears. I flew directly to another performance specific festival in Norway working again with Teresa. So this is the Between Sky and Sea Triennial, uh, the performance festival in Herdla. So look at gorgeous Herdla Island, which is quite close, about an hour outside of Bergen, the city I was in before. Due to the location, the festival requires an attunement to the site and most artists worked site specifically uh, at this outdoor festival. And this is the former army bunker that was where the artists uh, you lived. That was our residence. And then this is the daily view right across from the residence, right? So the festival is, is named between sky and sea, right? Obviously. And like, look at the cows and the farmer's land. So I loved the cows, but this is the only downside. I'm wearing four winter layers in August in Norway. And even in line for dinner, we didn't forget we're performance artists and 13 artists lived on site and worked towards developing a new work of visual art performance. And that's the curator, uh, Rita Marhog, who's a, a well-respected Norwegian performer. So, Here's the beginning of the performance. I had traveled over to Norway with these blue inflatable dresses. And I thought maybe we'll use them. And for many days, we couldn't figure out how to incorporate them. We loved how they looked, that they related to the site, the sky and the sea, and that they protected us while making our movements restricted, right? Lungwood and Carpenter are definitely about all the ways we try to reach towards each other, but we can't get there. Um, it kept us physically separate, but we were linked visually. We tried dancing together, brushing against each other, hugging, all these connections didn't work. Then the Eureka struck and we walked for 45 minutes to get into place, slowly barefoot on the long path around the top part of the island. We walked away from each other, never able to see the other once we parted. We encountered some viewers. <laughs> And during the walking, but especially once we reached our incredible sights, the two women become the marker, 
the beacon and the buoy. We both become the blue dot on the map, prominently echoing the surroundings, the crystal blue sky and the sparkling sea. Each is her own destination point, stuck in place. They can't see each other, but they can hear the other call out. Here, here, but also, of course, maybe here. And the viewers must turn their heads to see first one up high in the sky and then the other down low with the sea. Though they are both here, they are not together. Though they are not together, they remain connected. What is between sky and sea? Only here. Okay, so now here's the juicy inside scoop. I was totally cavalier about this performance. It was scheduled to be much shorter than our usual work, so the, the yelling of the here, once we reached our places, was only set to be uh, an hour and a half. You know, I was like, whatever, that's so short. Um, and we extended it with the barefoot walk, but whatever, we're, it's walking and standing, and it's, it was like cool Norwegian air. I mean, I was totally cavalier about it. It felt so easy. We still prepared, of course, um, but it was a busy week. Um, but, you know, I felt ready. So, I, I, you know, I was like, uh, all ready. No, no worries. However, at the end of the performance, my feet were killing me. It's very hard to stand on stone barefoot. And my arms in the dress, you couldn't quite rest your weight in the dress because of how it was constructed. And my, our concerns about the the seams and the inflate and holding the visual of the inflatable. So my arms were held aloft for all that time. My feet were killing me. Uh, the sun was hot. There were bugs darting at my face. A bee got inside my dress. And I fainted and fell off the stone into a trench filled with sharp stones and spiky brush. But what does a performance artist, artist do after coming to in a ditch, after falling off a mini cliff? A performance artist stands up and finishes the performance. So I was actually mad at myself for not being able to climb back up the rock, but I actually couldn't physically do it. But as soon as I kind of came to, figured out where I was, I stood up and kept calling the here. Teresa never even knew anything happened. And I controlled the time cue to end the work, so we both walked away as scheduled, though my dress was mostly deflated from saving my life. So when I had taken Teresa to see the site where I felt, you know, she saw me and she was like, you're all deflated, what did you do? And I said, well, I, I fainted and fell off the rock. And, and she was like, oh my gosh. And then I took her to the site and she got a little upset. She was teary. She said, oh my God, you do not know how lucky you are to not, you know, chip your tooth bash your face, break your leg, sprain your wrist, be in a Norwegian hospital. And I said, I know, the inflatable dresses were brilliant. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Here's uh, Herdla at the end, the perfect twilight photo of such a great experience. I just would like to say officially that I'm grateful for a faculty development grant from the university for specifically supporting this summer travel. It helped me with my plane ticket for this summer. And to the colleagues and students who made do the first two weeks while I was still fainting in Norway uh, and wasn't here. So now I'm almost caught up. So thank you, thank you.